All right. Okay. Good. So thanks. It's uh, this is interesting. It's it's work in progress. Uh, I mean, we've been working on it, me and Jean Philippe, for a few years, and we've we've got it rejected. This work, I mean, the paper underlying this work from both ICSP, ICFP, and Popol, and and we're now waiting for feedback from the Journal of Functional Programming, and uh, we got lots of interesting reviews, and the paper it grew longer and longer because they wanted more explanation, more examples, and so on. So I think it was thirty nine pages now. There is a an archive you can find it because it's while it's being reviewed, it's also online. Um, and I realized when I wanted to start giving a presentation about it that I could give a course <laughs> on the paper. That there's a little bit too much material. So I, I marked, I, I sort of selected a few things and then I marked some of the things afterwards as optional and maybe we'll have to skip some of the non-optional things as well. So it's um, it's finished work in the sense it all works and it's sort of the theory is that the paper is written and it's submitted, uh, but it's um, work in progress in the sense of how do you actually present this to um, the, this audience in a, in a suitable way. Anyway, tensor calculus, uh, two DSLs, curved space times, those are the words up in the title. So uh, tensor calculus is what uh, Einstein learned from uh, some mathematician friends for, for expressing uh, well, some kinds of differential calculus and so on, useful for getting uh, the possibility of actually writing down the curvature of space-time equations that uh, he did around 100 years ago. Um, the relativity things. We've tried to implement some DSLs in Haskell, the main specific languages in Haskell, to um, keep track of the types and, and also to help out with presenting these things because um, the notation is rather terse, so you might want a more typed and, and clear presentation, but you also want to be able to present the graphical view of the things. So if we move to um, sort of contributions here, there are two DSLs, one called Albert after Einstein and one called Roger after Penrose. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there is, they are sort of, well, you, you can convert between them. So there is a function in both directions from, from these two. So sometimes it's more convenient to use one of the languages and one, sometimes it's more convenient to use the other one. Uh, and when I say DSLs here, it's sort of it's there are some type classes which define some methods, and then you can instantiate them. And if you use all the only the type class methods and you're sort of polymorphic over these classes, then that's what you get in this Roger, the morphism based morphism based language. And then there is a this other language, the Albert, is is based on on linear types and uh, sort of index notation. So the example there is in Albert. Uh, it says example tu is a contraction, and then uh, to present it in the way that it's usually written with tensor calculus, we have i and i as a superscript and subscript. They are different Unicode characters. They are two different variables. <laughs> in in the linear code, you usually write i high and i low. But uh, if, they, if they're written like this, you can see that the index, the, act, the function application of t to the upper i and the derivative to the lower i uh, makes it look a little bit more like the index notation. But anyway, co contract takes a, a, a two argument expression and then it sort of basically sums it over the diagonal. So it lets i, both i's range over one to n if it's an n-dimensional space and it adds these things up. That's the product of the component of t and uh, the component of the derivative of, of u. So that, that's just well, straight. Yes. The gradient thing. Yes. I, it's, uh, so you here, if, if you want to look at the, the, the graph, you can see that you here has a very faint input arrow and output arrow, and that's an indication of its type. So it's actually just a scalar. It's not a vector or anything like that. It, it only, um, it doesn't have any vector inputs and vector outputs. We will get back to later what, what these things mean in more detail. But um, the, the U there is a scalar field. So it's a scalar. It could be the temperature field on the surface of the Earth or something like that. And then uh, T, on the other hand, um, is a vector field. And then you want to take the derivative in the direction of T of U. So the, that's basically what this thing is computing. 
but the, 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 the physics of the example is not the, the important thing here. It's just that it, it's a little bit fun that you can actually write a kind of example like this. You can render it as the more terse Einstein notation. You can render it uh, through this clever hacking that, that uh, Sean Philippe has been doing as a string diagram, or you can uh, run it with, with matrix representations of these tensors and, and compute results. And I, I hope to get the motivating example of describing Einstein's standard relativity equation, because that was one of the one of the more positive reviewers in the rejection from Popo saying, ah, this is really cool stuff. And it would be even cooler if you can actually show that you can express Einstein's general relativity and the Schwarzschild metric, which is a solution to that. And it's about black holes and stuff. Anyway, let's move on. So this was like the one minute version of the talk. This is a, most of the things there are not defined yet. So now we will get into uh, a more slower pace. So first, if you look at different books on what tensor calculus is, it will say, oh, what tensors are, it will say, well, the tensor of rank n is an array of three to the n values or tensor components that combine and so on. And something shouldn't vary as the coordinate system is changed. And then the other definition, it says an nth rank tensor in an m-dimensional space is, has n indices and m to the power of n components and obtains a certain, uh, obeys certain transformation rules. Um, these are typical definitions. I, I don't feel particularly informed by them. I mean, this, it sounds like it's some kind of rectangular box of number or multi-dimensional rectangular box of numbers, but these transformation rules are a bit mystical. Uh, I will not talk much about transformation rules in this talk, but they are uh, sort of coordinate transformation rules. And it's sort of saying that if you pick a coordinate system, you will get a collection of numbers here. If you pick another coordinate system, you will get another collection of numbers. And it's not actually the numbers in the, in the squares, which is the important thing, but the underlying tensor from which the numbers are computed. Um, and you could say that actually the numbers there in both these definitions should be a function of the kind of basis that you've got. So if you fix a basis for your vector spaces, then you go to a certain set of numbers. If you change the basis, you get another, another set of numbers. But this, this view is not what we will be working with. We will be working with the view of uh, tensors as elements of vector spaces. So then here is uh, just a very short definition of the core operations of a vector space. So first of all, it's a set of vectors V which supports addition, it has a zero and negation, so subtraction. And then, um, more, moreover, it also has a scaling operator. This is an infix operator with a little arrow <clears throat> part here, with the end is a scalar and the other end is a big vector. So you can take a scalar and, and make the vector longer in the same direction. And um, I've chosen here not to parameterize over S, but it's very open useful and possible to parameterize over S. We'll just fix S to be the scalar type and open it's either real numbers or complex numbers. But it's, it's useful to, to parameterize sometimes. But here it will be just a vector space over some scalars S. Um, a very simple example, if we have the scalars being real numbers, a 2D vector space V with two basis vectors E1 and E2, then any vector in this vector space can be written as a linear combination of a factor, so this is not v to the power of one, but the v indexed one, but sometimes the indexes are, are useful to have an upper or lower depending on, on the Einstein conventions. So this is saying the scale, the base vector one by the number v one and scale base vector two by number v two and add up the results. And generally speaking, every vector in the 2D space can be written as a linear combination of the base vectors in this way. Now we should note that depending on what E1 and E2 are, V1 and V2 will be different. So for example, if I make a very easy transformation, I make the base vectors twice as long, then V1 and V2 will have to be half as big. If I have longer measuring sticks, I will have to measure <laughs> smaller numbers. So, so um, these, when, when you do transformations, if the vectors transform in one direction, the coefficients will have to transform in the opposite direction. And the, the, the underlying vector is supposed to be the same. So it means that these, these are actually tensor components, V1 and V2 are the, the components of a tensor. 
So vectors simply yes. remember that S has to be a field or something? Yes, S has to be a field. So yeah, I, I didn't specify that here, but yes. So S is a field and then the... Okay. <clears throat> I think most of what we're doing, it would work with a ring yeah. over a, a module over a ring instead of a vector space over fields, but uh, yeah. at the end, as we want to do derivatives and stuff anyway later, so it's going to be at this point. Okay. Um, okay, so this is this was sort of the, the, the first example of a tensor, I guess, is, is this B. Um, and then we're moving an abstraction level up here. We're saying, okay, we will focus on finite dimensional vector spacing as objects and linear transformations between them as arrows or morphisms. And these arrows are actually tensors. So every tensor or, or every such linear transformation is a tensor and every tensor is such a linear transformation. And that means that if we want to do it in Haskell, we can define a class category. And here I'm saying that um, this Z is a two argument type constructor and I've written it in fix with the squiggly arrow here, but in Haskell it would just say Z, A, B or A, back uh, sort of quotes, Z, back quote, uh, A, and so on. So this is just to make the notation look like functions. So so it's a function, but it's not, well, in general, for the category, it doesn't need to be usual functions. It could be something else. So the identity and function composition or morphism compositions are methods in the class category, which is not our invention or anything. It's it's standard Haskell thing. And then, of course, lots of mathematics behind it uh, earlier. We have some notation though, which is useful to know. So first of all, this identity, the middle row here, notation wise, is, is the methods in Haskell. Uh, the upper row is the, the diagram notation for it. And the I and the J are sort of the input and the output index in this notation. And here is the commonly used mathematical notation. So what does it mean? Well, identity here, is now the identity linear transformation from a vector space to itself. So it takes any vector to the same vector. And for example, it takes the base vector E1 to the base vector E1 or EI to EI. And the I here is basically the index. You can think about it as the index of a base vector. So if you send in base vector EI, you will get out base vector EJ or other linear combination of those. And how many? Well, actually in the identity function case, this Chronic delta is only one when i is equal to j. So if you send in a base vector e1, you will get exactly one, com one contribution from base vector e1 and the output and nothing from the others. So it's, it's sort of the identity transformation here can be seen as a matrix, but it's the diagonal matrix with ones on the diagonal. So why, yes. why does it say j? Why does it say i to i? Well, it says I and J because that's basically the, 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 the type information. The, the notation here doesn't know about the semantics. So it just shows that there is there is an index I and it connects it to the, to the notation. So what in that says that it's the identity error? No, the, the, well, the, the fact that there is nothing on the, on, the, <laughs> on the wire. So there is no box on the wire that does anything. So the wire is the identity. But that's definitely a good question. So if, if two things, if two indices are connected, they are <laughs> the same. But they're okay. So mm -hmm. I is the same as J. Well, not that it's variables. They are no. values, uh, but so it's when you say I equal J mathematically, yeah. they are two different things, two different variables, but now you're telling that they are going to be equal. So it's the same kind of situation, right? So, so I mean think about it again, it's a linear transformation. And the linear transformation can be described as a matrix. The matrix has two indices to get into it, i and j. And it happens to be the case that only when i is equal to j is there one in the matrix and everywhere else is zero. So if you want to draw that. Okay, or, so that, the representation of id is the, is the line, but you have to have an input and output. Yeah. You can't just talk about the line itself. And so that this means i and j are linked by the identity. Yeah, error. So, so in this particular case, yes. Which means it must be the They, they will okay, end up yes. being basically nothing. Similarly here then, for, for a composition of two, two linear transformations, so I comes in to T and then it goes to, it to U and then it comes out to J. So how are these related when then you actually have to take, if you have the sort of 
tensor representation, or you think about the matrices with indices, you have an intermediate index here, K, and this K uh, in the standard Einstein convention, if it's used twice, once up and once down, it means actually an implicit sum. So there's a sigma over K here. And that's exactly what matrix multiplication is doing. So basically it's saying, if you want to know how much I is connected to J, you will have to take all of these components and sum up those which match up with the same K. And I mean, the, the computations are, are, are not important here, but that's sort of how uh, function composition is, it becomes here, it becomes matrix multiplication, basically. But they are not functions. Well, I mean, yeah, there are more in this category in general, yes, yes, but you, I mean, and, and also actually, if you want to have the matrix instance, they are functions from the two indices to the values in their sort of coefficient representations, but, but I mean, they are functions in the sense of linear transformation, but represent functions from one vector space to another. So functions from B to B in this case. But from maybe V to some W because the, the composition doesn't have to have the same type of the two sides. I think what's a bit confusing in this uh, picture is that one can confuse these indices by J with the types A, B, C on the yes. left hand side. So yeah. maybe that should be clarified. How oh, these are yeah. related to the types, basically, you want. Yeah, and, and, and that's a little bit uh, due to the fact that. In the, in the math notation, you always expect all these indices to be of the same type. There is one sort of blessed vector space V of dimension N underneath, and all of them are indexed over this. But it's convenient when you have this category notation to allow, for example, pairs and so on. So you might actually have some intermediate index which is actually sort of two indices or five indices or whatever. But in, when you write it out in this Einstein convention, all the indices are sort of expanded out and all the indices would be of the same type. Basically, the type values from one to n, <laughs> if you want to think about it as, as in this index numbers. We have a type class that relates the type of indices um, to the type of like things, like you say, this is an index for this type. Like mm. That's I mean, basically what, what we do is then we will have the, 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 the object here will be the index type. And then the arrows will be functions between the vectors over that index type to vectors over the other index type. Um, so you can actually, mostly you can think of these A's and B's here as, as very simple uh, finite things, which is the, the number of um, well, possible values for the base vectors. So indices for the base vectors on the left right. Yeah. We will see more <laughs> of it later. Um, yeah, the, the first, the simplest thing we could have, if you put a unit type, then it's a one-dimensional vector space. A one-dimensional vector space is taken the same as a scalar, so the real numbers. The vectors are just, a vector is just a number. There's only one base vector, and that's a one. Uh, if you take a canonical base vector, so every vector in the one-dimensional space can be written as, as some scalar times the one vector. It only has one direction. And then we have this V space in the previous slide, which had two dimensions. And if, if you have a linear transformation, for example, rotation by 90 degrees in the plane, thinking about the vectors as points in the plane, and then you want to rotate it, then the sort of, uh, you could have a matrix representation of that which would transform the coefficients in this particular basis. If you choose another basis, there would be another matrix representation. But the, the general idea of a, of a linear transformation, um, well, here it's captured saying it's, it's from this vector space to the other, the, to the same vector space. So it's from 2D space to 2D space. And um, it can be represented as a matrix, but depending on which coordinate system you choose, the matrix that have different numbers in it. So the tensor is sort of the abstract thing, and the actual numbers will depend on, on how you choose your basis. Okay, um, this is just a note that actually the linear transformations themselves are also vectors in the sense of the vector space in the abstract sense. You can add matrices, you can add vectors, you can add linear transformations. There is a zero transformation and you can subtract them, you can scale them. If you have a matrix of numbers, you can multiply them all by a factor C. That's the scaling. So it's 
um, you can actually sort of internalize the function space, I guess, if you uh, do it. So this, these are just what happens when you add two functions. Well, it's the function which adds the two of uh, the results from applying the functions to the same inputs. And this is actually, this instance declaration works fine more generally. It doesn't have to be a vector space in here, but it's sort of in the setting we have here on the both vector spaces. Well, is the vector space V, uh, is that necessary in the instance in the, in the below? Uh, that was what I was saying that that we actually don't use okay. the vector space okay. B properties it's just to make it consistent with that before that everything is a is a vector transformation. But for forgetting the instance through, it could be any type. It could be string. Right. Uh, we don't use and any the function. Could be any function. And what, and the the function could be any function. Then that could be yeah, any function to a vector space. So uh, because we use the operations only on the output of these functions, negate f of v, addition of f of v, well. <laughs> zero on the end side and scaling also on the end. So we lift the definition of, of, of these operations on the target vector space to uh, vector space of functions, linear functions. And uh, some examples. Uh, so now you can see a little bit, I, I say one to one here. So I, I think about this as a unit type and the unit type meaning the type, this type is the type of indices for the vectors in this space. So there's only one index meaning there's only one scalar in the vector, meaning it's basically a scalar. So, so um, a linear transformation from scalar to a scalar, that the only linear thing you can do is multiply by a constant. So linear here does not mean kx plus m, but from, from the bit of math in, in high school, it really means kx only. So it's only the k, it's only the coefficient because F zero has to be mapped to zero. So if it's a one-dimensional space, it's basically only contains scalars. Um, vectors are represented then as linear transformations from a scalar to, to V. So this means, okay, it's a linear transformation. You can give it any number, but it will only give a multiple of some base of some, some vector V. Um, if you swap the types around, vector, you get a sort of a vector eater. So something that takes a vector and returns a scalar. And uh, these are called co-vectors, uh, but they are um, dimension-wise isomorphic to, to the vectors. They are sort of transformed differently when you change coordinate systems. And then the thing we usually represent as matrices, uh, a function, linear function from V to V. And then there is some terminology, usually uh, in the, to say the order of the tensor is like the, a bit like the type, and the order is the number of V copies on the left and V copies on the right. So zero, zero, zero V's here, zero V's there, zero, one, one, zero, and one, one. So these are the orders of these tensors. And sometimes you just sum up these two numbers to say it's a, it's a second order tensor if it has one plus one or two uh, V's on either side. Okay, so in general, I mean, if it's feed M to VN, it's order MN. And you can think about it in formulas taking V vector, M vectors as inputs and produce M vectors as outputs, but it's a, it's a linear transformation, so it can't do whatever it wants. For example, this V to the power of M here is not the Cartesian product of these. So it's, for example, if you take V equals two, it's not a pair of vectors as an input, but it's treated more like a matrix. Because it's so it's 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 not just two vectors, but it's all combinations. So it's um, so all, all the, the exponents here are for for actually tensor product. And I, I don't really have time to go into exactly what tensor product means. But if you want to think about it, I think the easiest is to say that think about this thing that if you have two vector spaces with the basis B, indexed by v and w, the basis of the um, tensor product is the Cartesian product. So if you have a three-dimensional vector space and a two-dimensional vector space, you multiply these, you get six-dimensional tensors in the tensor product. So all choices of i and j indices into one or the other. So pairs of i and j are sort of the indices into this tensor product. So it's... Uh, <clears throat> and then, yeah, you can embed a pair into this, but you can't sort of get it back. 
So if you add two vectors, you can form, unfortunately, standard notation is the same as this, but this is the uh, tensor product of two vectors to produce a tensor. And this is the tensor product of two vector spaces to produce a vector space. But you, you can build from two vectors uh, and other vectors, but it will multiply the components. So if you have these two vectors, it would just say vi times wi. So it will, if it did the two times z examples before, it will fill in these six numbers, but it only had five data points from the beginning, two from, from v and three from the other. So they will be correlated, <laughs> these, these numbers. And uh, in general, a, a vector in or a tensor in this space is a sum of simple tensors, simple tensor being this product just of, of two of them. And the rank of a tensor is the number of numbers. And simple tensor, and for example, delta, this chronic delta, which is like the diagonal matrix in the 2D space, it's rank two, also the rank of rotate nine case two, and so on. It's the the number of um, well of these simple tensors you need to sum up to it. So in this, uh, the, the delta, for example, is E1, E1 plus E2, E2. If you took off uh, e, E1 tensor E1 plus E2 tensor E2. So that's going to be the one and the one is the positions and the others are not in the sum and therefore zero. Okay. Um, I mentioned that we call things which eat vectors, co-vectors. Uh, I will not use much of this later, it's just, just today, but it's sometimes you, you say, the well, you use the star for the dual of V, so you get a, a vector space which is isomorphic to the other space, and we can define a basis in a, in a sort of uniform way. Um, and they are similar to vector in that if you have a vector space underlying this V, which has N base vectors, also the co-vector space will have N base vectors. So uh, you'd only need to say what it does for all the base vectors in V. Um, and just because we will get to more complicated examples later, um, if you have an inner product, so something that takes two vectors to a scalar, that's the typical dot product in, in the in, in simple forces on, on the linear algebra. Uh, that is an example of a tensor product of order two zero. So taking two vectors in and returning one, just a scalar. And a metric is something we'll look at more later, which has the opposite type. It takes a scalar in and it just returns sort of two vectors, a, a full matrix of coefficients, order zero to. Okay, in notation wise, you use upper indices for the second component here. So the, uh, the vector part, and so the output index, and you use lower index for the co-vector side. So the, the one zero here means you have one lower index. And if you have a mixed thing with the lower and the upper, this is sort of the linear map then, one input index, one output index. It takes in the vector and produces out another vector. And the notation here, Tij, is sort of implicitly quantified with this i and j. It's supposed to mean, so for example, if you have this two-dimensional space, it's four values, two by two values. If it's an n-dimensional space, it's n square values are describing this. And you can also, as I mentioned earlier, you can multiply two tensors together. And this is basically the tensor product in the, in the Einstein notation, the index notation, it's not visible, there's just multiplication, implicit multiplication, and there's an upper and a lower indices index here. So this will be the type of a linear transformation, and it's very special such linear transformation. Uh, and yes, this, this multiplication of tensor adds their order. So zero, one here plus one, zero becomes one, one. So the order is just point twice added. Um, yeah, and, and then, <laughs> as we saw already in the very early example, if you have a term with some repeated indices, then they're implicitly summed over. So for example, the chronic delta ii, that means delta one one plus delta one two two plus delta three three up to, well, whatever the dimension of the underlying space is. If this is n, then we get n once summed up. And, uh, this is just a, an arbitrary example showing how the notation sort of works. This, this is a tensor of order one, two. 
the, it's an addition of two things which both have order one, two, and here it has one lower, that's the one, and two upper indices, that's the two. And here you'll have to sort of chase the indices to see what's happening. You can see that the I appears there, and then the J and K are up there, so they are, are involved, but then the L is used twice and the M is used twice. So there are two summations here, over all L and all M. So it's, if it's a three-dimensional vector space, this will have uh, two sums over three elements, meaning nine terms just to be above this one value. So the scope of these is only in the multiplication? Yes. In the big multiplication? It's sort of... The scoping rules are never described in a math book. I understand. As, um, <laughs> as for integral. But in your math book, it's described. Yes. Yeah. So, so we will we will actually, we can't have the notation this short mm -hmm. and, and clean. We'll have to actually bind this variable. Short, so, yes, clean, no. So yeah. the, the very thing is, you can always pull. So the binders, they are always uh, summation. And because it's linear, you can always put them at the top. Right. Line. OK. So that's. Okay, well, it okay. doesn't change the semantics. Yeah. It may change the operational behavior if you run it, but yeah. Yeah, but it does cause confusion. <laughs> At least in my head. Um, okay, so implementation, I will say very little of implementation, but just what I said before, but a little bit deeper, saying that there are two DSLs, one for the morphisms and one for something emulating this index notation. And um, the Morbison DSL, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's named after Roger Penrose, <coughs> who did lots of things with his diagrams and so on, and got the Nobel Prize and so on. Um, and uh, it's based on symmetric monoidal categories. So there's lots of sort of facts behind it, and all of these things can be drawn as diagrams and so on. And then the DSL for index notation is called Albert after Einstein, and it's actually using linear types. So we had so far, linear transformations in the linear algebra sense, but here we, for the implementation, we're using linear functions in the programming languages sense. So the two different kinds of linear, that's, that's why I put a type linear here. And, and these chords, that's the thing to the piece here, uh, that you can think about them as indices. So uh, for example, if you have in Roger, a tensor from A to B, then you can transform it to in this Albert as a function from P of A and P of B, but then we just have to have a little bit of garbage here to keep track of which category we're in, so we can get back to it. And then we have to be polymorphic in a, a type, a little bit like uh, run ST or so on. We have to keep track that we don't sort of uh, uh, run out of abstractions here. So this for all R, so this is sort of a polymorphic function and then from such a polymorphic function, we can get back again. So we can encode and decode and transform, which means that if we have certain combinations which are more convenient to write in one of the languages, we can write it there and then transform it. And we can combine pieces that this little piece is written in Albert and this little piece is written in Roger and then we sort of mash them together. It's interesting the choice of name of encode and decode. You can see which one you prefer. Yeah. Well, it's not at all obvious. Uh, I mean, uh, you could, oh, sorry, you, you could say that you, you um, yeah. But for historical reasons. Yeah, it, it's very, from, from the, the way you write programs, the, the sort of point free notation of the categories is really rather than encoding. But um, so maybe the opposite direction would be. You could call it an right. You have to choose. You could call it a fly and abstract. Also, one yeah. yeah, we, we have so uh, it creates one by a formal function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there are different views. But if, uh, as you can get back and forth, it shouldn't matter too much what you put them Um, And here is <laughs> lots of symbols. So this is, is towards the, well, this symmetric monoidal categories node. So actually, you don't only have a category, you also have a number of other operators. So these are basically plumbing. So when I say plumbing, I mean how to get the right inputs to the right places when you don't have like lambda expressions and so on. So this is, for example, swap. If you have uh, A, B, you get the B, A. This is associators, alpha and alpha inverse. So A, B, C to A, B, C and the opposite. And these are sort of inventing and deleting a unit. So um, 
these are just isomorphisms. And then you have the tensor product. So if you have two of these uh, arrows from unrelated types, you can pair them up and take a pair of the inputs to a pair of the outputs. But notice it isn't a pair. It's a tensor product. So it means basically random in parallel. And we have some graphics for this as well. So for example, here is the associator. And it's illustrated by having three input indices, i, j, and k, i and j being a little closer together. And here, l, m, and n, the output indices, m and n are a little closer together. So that's illustrating the b and c being close and a and b being close there. And then this is the, yeah, in, in the, this notation, and then it's what it would be in the, in the index notation, and this is the type of this instance. <clears throat> so we, we exemplify it for having the same underlying type for all the arguments, because it would be a bit more complex otherwise. And some of the others, this is swap. It's clearly more visible that it's swap in the graphical notation, so it just leads the, the arguments in different directions. And then, interestingly, for the tensor product here, it's sort of completely independently doing T and U. So they've got I and J as input to get K and L as outputs, and T and U are eating one of them each, but they are not really interacting. Okay, lots of notation. Um, why are the string diagrams useful? So this is, this is an example saying, asking the question, are these two expressions equivalent? Is Sigma after id u after sigma after id u the same as u after what well, u in parallel with u. And it's easier to see if you do the diagram form. So if you render this, you will get this expression. And you can see, well, ah, okay, i goes into u there and it goes out to k, and this this one sort of takes a roundabout root to L. So it's actually if you pull the wires, you will get the right hand side. So it's not, of course, a proof, but it actually has this topological uh, nice property that if you if you sort of pull at the wires and, and you get the other one, then, then they're actually equal. So uh, here you can see an example. Of course, there are algebraic rules. There are, you can rewrite this one to that one by several steps, but you can also perhaps from the graphics see it easier. And I mean, what's easier for one person is maybe more difficult for another one. So um, it's good to have both views so you can sort of mix and match between them and see where one is helping and the other is not. Um, another little notation, um, an order two, two tensor anti-sim. So it's the identity minus swap. So uh, in diagram form, it's, well, <laughs> the identity on pairs will be two identities and minus and then the swapping. And it's very often used actually. So this whole thing subtract and then subtract this one. So there's actually a special notation for it that's often used. So this means anti sim So it takes i and j in and it will lead both a positive uh, connection from i to k and, uh, well, a negative connection from the other one. And what happens in practice is, for example, I mean, as this, as this will, um, feed in, I mean, if you think about the matrix M, so M I J and M J I will be subtracted if you compose this with the matrix. So that means if the matrix is symmetric, if M I J is equal to M J I, then the result would be zero. So this is one way of expressing that, that uh, well, if you combine this, you can symmetrize or anti-symmetrize different terms. Um, this is now optional, it says, and I don't have time for it, so let's skip ahead. Optional, optional, summing up. Okay, now I have to say a little bit about tensor fields. So, so far, you could talk most of the things, well, except the derivatives, in, in a tensor which doesn't vary over space. So it's just a tensor. But very often, when tensor calculus is used, you have varying um, coordinate systems. So for example, here on the right is a sort of an illustration of what the basis vectors look like for the polar coordinate system. So this origin is here, and the blue arrows are the radial basis vectors, and the red arrows are the sort of angular basis vectors. So they change from point to point, 
which means that, for example, if we describe a vector field as being equal to the base vector ER, the base vector in the radial direction, that does not mean it's constant because the base vector itself changes in space. So you can have something which is equal to ER, but its direction is different in every point in space. And that means that if you express things in a coordinate system which varies over space, then you have to be careful when you take derivatives. You, can just, you cannot just take derivatives of coefficients. So spatial derivatives here is what we're talking about. I mean, how, what change you get when you move from one point to another. And there is this nice <laughs> nabla symbol, which then can be typed in this setting as taking a tensor from A to B and adding another input argument. And what's this input argument for? It's the direction in which you look at the derivative. So it's sort of directional derivative in direction of this vector. And tensor-wise, it means you raise the order of the first component of the pair. So you have an mn tensor, it becomes an m plus one n tensor. Uh, the simplest examples are, are like gradients and so on. Um, this is just to show that we've got notation for these things as well. The, the derivative is actually a rounded box with a little bit thicker lines than this inner box, which is just a, a tensor. And it has an extra input. You see the i here goes just to the box. So this is the vector, um, the direction of derivative inputs. And then the J input goes directly into the tensor J, UK. So it, this sort of shows that now you have a, a tensor with two inputs and one output, and T itself only had one input and one output in this particular example. We also have notation for the part from the derivative, which has this square box instead. And this is useful later because we, as the basis changes everywhere, its derivatives will come up. And it's very often comes up everywhere. So there's actually a special notation for, for how the basis is changing or the metric is changing. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, this little, uh, I guess, and gate or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gate anyway, but it's a good symbol here. So, yeah. I mean, I invented this notation because. Uh, <laughs> but it's not standard time. So if you have a better idea. Okay. And I should just mention here, I use, I, I'm trying to say that this one is symmetric. It's it inputs indices. And that's saying that if you put it and swap in and add them up or subtract them, you will get zero. So this is a, a short way of saying that, that this is equal to zero is a short way of saying that this could, uh, this one, which is called the Christoffel symbol, uh, is actually symmetric and it's two i and j indices. And now I think that I only got a very few minutes left because we want to be able to get to the um, real talk at what is what is it called the colloquium at twelve. So I will uh, illustrate something. So uh, first of all, there are derivative laws, and you can also do them. As, uh, you can render them as diagrams, and you can then get to what. So the second half was uh, saying that you can express general relativity equation the curvature of space-time. And this is an expression for using um, the, the tensor's notation for expressing the curvature of space-time. And these, the components that are in here, what I should at least mention. So on the right-hand side is a source term. That's where all the mass and energy in the universe comes in as the distribution. And then everything on the left hand side, there are these basically different versions of the Riemann curvature tensor, which is a way of measuring how curved space time is. But notice it has four indices. So it's as this is all in a four dimensional space time, it has four times four times four times four components. So uh, <clears throat> it's a, an annoyingly big thing. So it's good that the notation is here, otherwise, we would have to write out 256 equations. Uh, one for each of the combinations of indices. Um, and th there, is, there is an interesting proof here that, that shows how you get from one formulation of it to another, but I just want to get to the point math example and mention that we, as I said, the, the differential equation for general relativity talks about the curvature of space-time. 
And that's that's what you actually get when you solve it. You get a metric tensor which shows how curved space time is. And you can express one well known solution, which actually was published just a month after the relative, general relativity was published by Schwarzschild, who later very soon died. And this, this is a, a special four by four matrix, basically, which has these uh, um, components of the Schwarzschild metric. And it has some particular expressions. The fun thing to know here is these, we actually have a data type of syntax trees for these. So we do symbolic computation with these. We don't use numbers here, we use actually but uh, a little data type with, with sine and cosine and multiplication and so on. So when we enter it into the action the differential equation, we will get big expressions and lots of them for all the combinations here, but they all simplify to zero. And we did not implement a big algebraic simplifier. We took the output and we spliced it into <laughs> an off-the-shelf tool and it simplified it to zero. Um, it's just worth noting that two of these terms are such that strange things happen for different values of rho, which is the radius parameter here. So one thing is if rho is zero, then of course it goes to infinity. So this whole thing is for a point mass at the origin. So if you get to the origin, everything blows up. But, oops, sorry, uh, there is also to the power of minus one here, which means if this whole parenthesis is zero, it will also blow up. And that happens when rho is equal to rs, which is called the, the sort of radius, the event horizon of, the, of this uh, system. And event horizon, that's connected to black holes. And you wonder, where on earth did a black hole come from? I mean, we, we started with the point mass and wanted the gravitational potential, basically, of the point mass. And in, in Newton and in, uh, mechanics, it would just be one over r or something like that, the potential. But here, we get the metric, and the metric has strange properties. But the thing is that if you put mass in one point, it will be a black hole because there is a certain density limit for, for mass. So if you have two mass mass, mass in a small region, it will behave as a black hole. And if you have a point mass, that has infinite density of mass. So any mass you point at one point in space will be a black hole, even if it's a gram. It will be a very, very tiny black hole. <laughs> and uh, for example, here, if we take the mass of our sun, you get the radius uh, event horizon of three kilometers. If you take the mass of Earth, it would fit in this, this space. So this is really dense stuff. And if the moon, well, that would you crunch into one, well, a tenth of a millimeter. And I think I will have to, well, I can at least mention the, the, the interesting thing that when we, what, what happens these, these coordinates are basically for a far away observers. So if you fall, if you have, a, if you're looking at the safe distance from a black hole at an object A that falls into the black hole, then what these metric coefficients means that for us it will take infinite time for it to reach the event horizon. So basically, that's I would say that it never gets there. But that's not what is experienced by the object that's falling. So for that, it takes finite time to get to the horizon. There is, there is, the horizon is not a, a border in the physical sense. It, it's, there, it's a point of no return, but it's, there is nothing physical that's in the way there. It just continues through at great speed. By that time, it will be very close to the speed of light and so on. And I, I say uh, without problems, but being a point of re no return is, I guess, a problem. <laughs> and, and also, it will very soon crash into the, the origin then which actually for, for a solar mass black hole just takes six microseconds from the horizon to the Earth. But if it's a really supermassive black hole that has been observed in other galaxies, it could be going for another 10 minutes before you crash into the center. Um, not that we would know if that's actually true because nobody has tried and nobody can come back. Anyway, this was as was I had as beginning as well, just saying, Two bit tensor DSLs um, they are connected by morphisms. They are um, the library has these rendering functions, so you can get these diagrams out, or you can get these Einstein notation things out, and you can do symbolic computation uh, with expressions. So you can experiment a bit with uh, what you get from different differential equations and potential solutions. And uh, yeah, that was all.
Maybe one question, if anyone has a question. Why was it rejected? Well, they thought it was complicated. Um, and then we added some stuff, some more explanations, and then they thought also it was complicated, and then we added some more stuff. Now it's 39 pages. And it gets less complicated for everything you have. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, examples, more explanations, uh, and, and so on. So um, now we're, of course, a little bit worried about the poor JFP reviewers who have to read 39 pages of this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, we submitted it in like November, December, something like that. So we'll, we'll see where, where it goes. But we got really useful feedback from the reviewers, both from ICFP and from, from so we, we, from Pop also. We, we, we did improve the paper in several different ways. Mm -hmm. And then we were sort of encouraged to do this general relativity example, which was, which did show that we had some problems in some combinations because it was very hard to get it from that level, but then it sort of worked out. So yeah, it's fun. So it's based on your diagram stuff, but did you manage to write or did you manage to publish that? Because when you talked about it, you said it was rejected also. No? No, okay. it was, uh, it was not. <laughs> okay. Uh, it was published at the time already. Well, no, it's this one was rejected. So, okay. yeah. uh, it's I mean, it's so if you maybe we can, if you go back to this encode decode, I can tell you one thing. Like, okay. am I okay. thing? Let's see what is. Uh, oh, wait, it should be further off. Yeah. There. So, the encode decode that you see there. So if P is an index, um, it's not exactly right, yeah, because um, you have two indices and then you return the real number. Here it says you get an index as input and you output an index, so this is incorrect. So the actual thing that is used in this paper is a different version, which says P Z R A linear P Z R B dual linear real value. Okay. Uh -huh. So okay. that yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this for the underlying. You could uh, say that the monolithic yeah, This is the difference, but in fact, um, so the jump for me on this part it was to translate the thing with the dual thing in back into this, so that it can really piggyback into the. Uh, the general the thing on symmetric monoidal categories. Yeah. Okay. I, I want to be in another room in seven yeah. minutes. So we're right. probably happy. <laughs>